Oh my god, the time is here. The FNAF movie is out. Uh, the animatronic characters here. I just got done watching it in theaters. <laughs> Are you f kidding me? I wouldn't pay money for this hot garbage. I watched it on Peacock. I signed up for a nice free trial. It immediately canceled my membership afterwards. Ooh. <sighs> Work the system, baby. And now, I, you know, I've made a lot of predictions. I've made quite a bit, eh, I wouldn't say quite a bit of FNAF content. I've made a little bit of FNAF content. Made a little prediction deal once the trailer was released. Nailed it. Nailed everything. Nailed it all. Go watch it back. Fucking, hey, Kobe from the three. You know what I'm saying? Switch. Something did happen that I feel, I didn't think that my mind would go to this place and that I would be confronted with these feelings, but I have to eat my words a bit. Willy's Wonderland and uh, Banana Splits. They make the FNAF movie look like a three-year-old... A three-year-old. <laughs> I can't think of something. I didn't think I'd ever say this, but I have to give props to Willy's Wonderland and the Banana Splits because at least things, they happen in those movies. Am I going to say that they're good movies? No. I will never bend the knee and say that those are enjoyable movies, but I will give them credit over like animatronic killers. It's at least somewhat fun. Like I can see why somebody would like them. You get a lot of action in Willy's Wonderland with Nicolas Cage slapping a plastic doll, basically. That's fine. I mean, sure. Is it stupid? Yeah. Yeah, but I can see people just being like, oh, it's silly and fun, whatever. Banana Splits does the exact same thing. You know, you, you get to experience the whole studio stage and all like the little traps and gimmicks they do to kill people. And it's, it's fine. It's bad, but it's fine. You know, who cares? It's fun. The FNAF movie, to generalize it, and you can click off of it because I know all the FNAF fans are beating their fists and they're strapping their safety helmets on. They have their spit bibs and they're like, Duh! But the FNAF movie does the most criminal thing of all. It took the safest route to be as middle of the road and boring. It's for, it's boring. It's so fucking boring. Oh my God. Oh my God. How do you, you stop? How does this movie, how is it boring? How do you let that get to the pipeline where it's just like, perfect. It's like a unsalted potato. That's exactly what we wanted all along. It's like one of those stereotypical plates of like a British dinner where it's like just a plate of brown. That's what the FNAF movie is. It's just, it's no taste. It's there. You can eat it if you want, but it's not going to be satisfying. We're going to talk a little bit about it today. I'm not going to, usually in these videos, I like to go through and I like to talk about the beats of the movie and talk about it, but I think it's so new. I won't do tons of spoilers, but I'm still going to put a little spoiler warning and then probably still spoil the movie. I would talk about the movie, but not a lot happens. But for our our viewers who are just tuning in now hi nice to meet you i'm hunter people hate me when i make these reviews and uh what is fnaf which fnaf is a survival horror game there's like 20 fucking five of them been around forever you probably saw one of those markiplier videos that has 100 million views and him screaming or him saying was that the bite of 87 which that happens in this movie oh! And that's FNAF. And you've probably seen people with, you know, Freddy Fazbear, and you've probably heard a sound, you've probably seen memes. It's like one of the biggest internet games ever. I don't know. Why would you click on this video if you don't know what the fuck it is? Fuck you. But let me talk to you about the general story. What happens in the movie? Which, this movie stars Josh Hutcherson. 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 Hutchinson? Hutchinson. Hutchinson. What? Hutch? Hutch? It's Josh Hutcherson, right? It's not Hutchin, is it? Hutcher. Hutcherson. Josh Hutcherson. Let me tell you, dude, that motherfucker. First of all, Josh, good job getting the bag, dude. I know they probably paid you a pretty penny for this little flick. It is Blumhouse, though, so I don't know. They're probably like, are you sure? Do you really need that much, Josh? This is going to be a big hit. We can get you on the back end in uh, bonus percentages. And then they're like, by the way, we're also releasing it on Peacock. And he was probably like, yeah, fuck. Josh Hutcherson, he tried his best. And it's not his fault. Really, the only actor in this film that wasn't good was the little girl, Abby, which is his sister in the movie. We'll get to that. But Josh Hutcherson, I mean, you could tell that he was working with what he had and the script was just abysmal. This, this is a joke, right? I mean, there be somebody controlling them, right? I mean, okay, good joke. Congratulations, you got me. So Josh, you know, take. <laughs> Tip of the hat to you, my friend. Uh, Oops, I didn't mute this. But the movie follows Mike and Abby, and Mike is a degenerate who lives with his sister, even though they're like, the age difference is just too much. The year is 2000. We see it in a security cam footage one time, so I think it's like the year 2000. And Mike has custody over his sister because his dad killed himself, and the mom died of a sickness, disturbed down to sickness. Oh, wow. 
You have cancer, Andy. Mike is plagued by dreams of his brother being abducted. Uh, his brother's name is Garrett. When he was a kid, he saw him get abducted. So that plagues him. So it's a big dream themed movie. First of all, there's probably a world where that works, but it just, it muddies the whole thing up bad. But essentially he needs some work because he beat a man half to death for, actually that was really funny. He sees a child walking away, getting kind of dragged away by a dad. I mean, I immediately assumed that it was his dad, but he's a security guard and he goes to check on him. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, he's going to go be like, hey, sir, is everything okay? No, he just tackles him into a fountain and beats the shit out of him. And then he gets arrested. And now he can't hold a job because he's mentally unstable. Thank God he has custody of an 11-year-old girl. Now, this is a PG-13 movie, so nothing happened, but let me tell you, if, if that little R showed up, I don't know what would have happened in this movie, okay? All I know is that he goes to a career counselor, which ends up being Matthew Lilliard, Lilliard? Whatever. The guy who's shaggy. He was also in Scream. I like him a lot. He was also in 13 Ghosts. That was a bad horror movie. A really bad, really bad horror film. But he was also in Serial Mom. I like Serial Mom. You like Serial Mom? Roger Waters? Roger Waters is Pink Flamingo guy, right? Who am I thinking of? Is Roger Waters the, that's the basis for Pink Floyd. John Waters. John Waters. Roger Waters, I think, is the... I don't know. It doesn't matter. Essentially, he's like, oh, I have a job for you. And it's, you know, the five, you have to stay at Five Nights at Freddy's. And he gives him the job. And from there, he has like weird dream sequences and starts seeing ghost children. Yada, yada, yada. It ends up being Freddy Fazbear and all that kind of stuff. And he has to find out who killed his brother or who stole him through dream sequences. It's like that Stephen King movie from 2005 called Dreamcatcher. Terrible. Once again, awful. Feels very similar to that. There's a cop that randomly shows up, ends up being William Afton. If you don't who that is, neither do I, neither does any of the people who don't know the franchise. Ends up being William Afton's daughter. She ends up helping him defeat the animatronics, but the animatronics are innocent children who are ghost trapped inside the animatronic. And it turns out that the career counselor guy is actually William Afton, even though he said his name was like Steven Agdler or something like that. And then he dies. And then they set up sequel bait. Also, Matt, Pat, and Corey Kenshin are in it. That's the movie! And if you think that I'm selling it short, you're dead wrong, baby, because that's essentially the story. I'm not going to go into it by detail, because, my God, the video has to have something. Like, my video has to have more than what the movie had, okay? So let me, I'm just going to say the pros. Costumes and puppets, I'll eat my words. They look great. Jim Henson's company, right? Awesome. They looked great. The whole problem with them, though, was that they're just not scary. But once again, I think that's just the script and, like, the ways you could have done about it. The people who were hired to do the job, killed it. Also, the sets look good. I liked being in the pizzeria. The pizzeria was so much more enjoyable than like Willy's Wonderland. Willy's Wonderland set is... <laughs> God, just abysmal. Even the animatronics, which no, not trying to put down anybody because I'm sure whoever worked, it doesn't matter. They weren't, they didn't look as good. It didn't look as good. I don't, what am I supposed to tell you? All right. And Josh Hutcherson. That's the pros. If I had a scroll, I like hit it down. I'm like, yep, that's the three of them. Look at that. Now let me get my cons list ready. <laughs> <laughs> The cons list. Start with the script. The script, I don't know how it's possible that a professional movie like this could have so many egregiously bad lines. Like, very typical, trying to be funny and cute, but it just is cringe. It's just very odd. The pacing of the movie in which the story goes to is a slog because we have like 75 fucking dream sequences of going in the same wooded area and Josh Hutcherson talking to children. It's not interesting. Like, every time I'm introduced to a ghost, I don't care. I'm like, okay, cool, you died, dude. Tough shit. There's no emotional depth or anything that gets me attached to these kids. They introduce, like, a weird kind of... Kind of remind me of the black phone. A guy who abducts children, and then now they're ghosts. And they're just like, we need help, or we're gonna help you. It's that, except you don't get to spend any time with the abductor, or, like, getting to emotionally resonate with these people. It's kind of like black phone meets children of the corn, where the whole time you just want to punch the... Not so much because the kids are bad, but just because it's like, get the hell out of here. I don't care. There's nothing like tying me down to caring about like, how do the kids get abducted? How do they get killed? Like there, there's no like emotional resonance to have them be like, hey, sympathize with me as a character, Josh Hutchinson. But no, he's just like, have you seen my brother that died 25 years ago? Sure, you can be emotionally invested in that and you can be sad about that. Nothing says that you can't. But at the same time, it's just like, dude, you're like 34 years old. Like, have you not processed that? 
that at all? 34 years of your life, you've been having consecutive nightmares about this exact situation, and it wasn't until you got a pizzeria fucking security job that it starts to make sense? Hello? Am I crazy? Is this recorded? Yes, it is! The script feels like it's written by children, which I don't know. I mean, I'm going on a limb by saying that that's a creative decision because the whole movie is so centered around kids, kids' memory. Like, Abby is connected to the kids because she's been having dreams about them, and you're probably wondering why she has that, but don't worry, they don't explain that. She just does. It feels very childlike, but it doesn't feel fun or, like, creepy. It just feels, like, annoying. Like, I was just annoyed and bored. Just so boring. That's, like, the biggest thing is, like, even if things do make sense, you're just like, huh. I bet you anything, if I was a betting man, there was way more dream sequences in the first draft of the script. And it's like, he goes back to a dream again. And people were probably like, we should probably do something else besides the dreams. If I had to, if I was a betting man, I don't know. So they introduce like an aunt who's trying to take custody of Mike's sister. And there's like, she's always with this like fat lawyer who looks like he's scared. I think that the lawyer is supposed to be comedic relief. But if anything, that was the most haunting part of the film was just being like, you should watch what you do with your diet. Like I looked at that and I was like, that's me in like five, six years, I don't know. But he's, she's always there with a lawyer and she's trying to get custody of Abby, which the first time that you see the aunt, I was like, who is this? What the hell is this? And then she's like, well, I'm here with my lawyer to get custody from you, blah, blah, blah. And it isn't until like a few scenes later when you find out that it's the aunt. It's just so random and weird. And then also it's like, he's like, she doesn't even care about Abby. All she wants is the monthly check from the state. But the whole movie is contingent on Mike finding a job. And it's like, if the check is that enticing to get, why is he stressing? so bad about a job like can't he afford stuff like isn't that the government aid that he's getting i guess he has to find a job for his parole is that what it is but that isn't established either it's just weird like there's no indication of like okay well you have to find a job or else you'll be penalized you can't support this girl we're gonna take her away from you because you're financially inept those are motives instead it's just like i gotta find a job but i can't work nights and then the lawyer comes in with the dumb aunt bitch lady and he's like all right fine you twisted my arm i'll take the night shift that's like that's the legitimate flow of the movie. Oh, I mean, I could go, I could go on so long. Like this is just, but anyways, uh, other cons, the editing, there's a lot of editing choices, like a lot of weird cuts and like zoom ins on weird times. It throws off the pacing tension in a lot of weird ways. It's just, I don't know. The movie, it's competent enough, but there's a lot of moments where you're like, what? What? Ha Why? Why would you do that? The YouTube cameos? No Markiplier, dude! Fu hey, fucking spoils for real. No Markiplier. Wow. How are you gonna do that, dude? We do get Matt Pat and Corey Kenshin, which love those boys, but my God, they really, once again, directors, Hollywood system that doesn't understand why people like YouTubers, why people are attached to people in this content, and they just throw them in and they're like, Matt Pat, you work at a diner, and at the end, you talk about hunger and say that it's just a theory. All right, roll. Action. You know, it's just a theory. Are you being paid for Okay. <laughs> and then Corey Kenshin's just a taxi driver, and he does a scream. What the? Goodness. That felt just random, like they just did that. Well, yeah, it was just like, all right, we got another guy. The other biggest con about this film is that if you don't know the movie, you're not gonna understand a lot of these like little stings and stuff, which is usually forgivable whenever it doesn't really impact the story, but they put it so up in your face that it feels like impossible to not be like, oh, well, what, that, what is that supposed to be? Like I watched this with Nick and Josh Hutcherson opens up the locker and there's like a statue of a balloon guy and then it does like a jump scare thing like, <laughs> it's like oh, he just turns it around and that's the only time we see that movie until the end when it's in cory kenshin's seat i said read this <laughs> and then nick said oh that's balloon boy and i was like hmm what is why what does that mean and he's like oh it's just one of the characters why give that much emphasis on a jump scare to that thing? Because it was just distracting from that point. I'm like, oh, was well, it going to come to life or something? Nope. Just a big jump scare sting. <laughs> Bloom Boy. Remember him? People in the audience say, I don't know what that is. Don't worry. We're moving past it. Keep watching. The movie gets real good. A lot of stuff like that. The biggest thing that I want to talk about is why doesn't it work? Yes, it's a boring slog fest, but why? Why does it not work? We go back to the dream sequences of it being all these ghost children and all this back and forth of these dream sequences. But by doing Doing so, there's so much exposition and lore that is just given to Mike or Josh Hutcherson's character. He never has to work for anything. There's nothing that he truly ever uncovers. Like whenever the first time he's like, Abby, this drawing, like, is that supposed to be our dead brother? And she's like, yeah, yes. Tom Garrett got taken. 
Yo, Abby, what the hell is going on with these animatronics? She's like, yeah, they're ghosts. That's how they make him move. Are they... Ghosts? Of course. How else could they make the robot to move? <laughs> and it's like, okay, so that's just... Yeah, we're gonna keep that in the script. We're, ge we're keeping it? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna keep it. Okay. Even the first time that Josh Hutchinson gets the reveal that the animatronics are like playing with his sister, it's just like, don't worry, they're fine. They were tickling me. We're having so much fun. They're <laughs> ghosts. They're ghost children. They died before. It's fine. Don't even look into it. It's fine. Abby's saying that, you know, she's seeing her dead brother in her dreams that she's never met. That's really strange and like very prophetic. We don't ever like dive into that. Vanessa, who's the random cop. <laughs> she <laughs> She's like the worst cop to make her a cop didn't make any sense which it's like maybe it's supposed to be that she has authority for like watching over her dad's pizzeria but we see only one cop in the movie and it's her and at one point she gives josh hutcherson her keys to drive the cop car across town but well, why don't you just drive him or go with him she's like i can't confront him but then later she just shows up immediately. Did you fight some inner demon in yourself off camera to like get the will to come here? It's very unsatisfying to see a person be like, I can't do it. I won't do it. I can't confront my daddy, William Afton. And then two scenes later, she's like, I'm here to help you. And I'm saving you right now. It's like the wind out of my sails. The wind is out of my sails. We are in idle water playing with like a ball in a cup. Actually, that wouldn't even be, that wouldn't be correct because ball in a cup is actually pretty fun for like the first five minutes. And that would be more enjoyment than I got out of this film. <sighs> Vanessa, at one point, she just spills everything out right there. His name is William Afton. It's not even that Mike, Josh Hutcherson's character, is like, hey, I found out about your dad. And it's like, oh, a big reveal. He's just like, Vanessa, what is going on? And Vanessa's like, my dad is a serial killer named Willie Mafton. 308 Negra Arroyo Lane, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87104. And all of those animatronics are ghost children that were killed by my dad. And their bodies are in the animatronics. My dad is Willie Mafton. I can't confront him. And it's like a two minute thing where it's like, cool. The first time I saw you, an hour and a half ago? You could have told me it then. It's not like also she was like, you need to get out of here. Nah, nah, nah. There was nothing. It was just kind of like one day she was like, oh, I'm going to tell you. There it is. You're told. Doesn't it feel rewarding? And once again, the constant dream sequences of like... Having our main character be able to go into his dreams and talk to the ghost children of these animatronics, making it that easy for him to interact with them is such a bummer. It takes out the entire intrigue of their being ghost in general, him being able to conversate with them and try to like construct a plan to figure out who killed his brother before, which once again, it's just like so obvious. It's like, well, dude, it's hello. It's the fucking William Afton guy. Like, what are you Whoa! did? Like, seriously, like, immediately being able to like go to sleep and you're just like hey can i get some exposition yes you can oh i woke up dang it no more exposition and a character walks in they're like i got more exposition for you oh thank god i don't want to actually have to work for anything the biggest problem with that and I, I think i'm connecting my thoughts here i know i'm rambling and complaining but mike never has to actually explore the pizzeria we don't get to actually have him have to like make the conscious decision to leave the room and like try to find clues or figure out what's going on you could have had the weird moment where abby is like playing with the animatronics and he's like that was fucking strange which turns the light switch on in his head of like this is weird i should go and investigate some stuff have him reveal these things in time or maybe he finds a fucking child's dead body or something like that which i know you can't do anything that gruesome because it's pg-13 and you're trying to get all of the 12 year olds who like this shit into the theater i get it but it's just you know that's what i, that's what I want to do over and over again you just come on Come on. And the big delineation isn't even the fact that it's like animatronics that don't look scary, because I think that there is something unsettling about something that could look innocent, that of course in turn becomes something more evil or violent. But the reason the games work is because these things are sitting idle looking at you and you're having to conserve this power, like resource management, and you're the one who has to click the button and look over at these door frames, or you're the one who they're attacking. It feels very personal. It feels like you are in the pizzeria yourself. It translated into this typical shitty Hollywood would horror film none of that magic translates through and that's like the biggest thing i want to say with this is that even though i'm not like a fan i can still appreciate how interesting the lore and world building is of fnaf through all of these games and it isn't a criticism of fnaf the franchise it's the criticism that they took this thing and just 
I don't even know if I want to go on a limb and say that they did a cash grab. I just don't think that they tried at all to make it an experience that could be similar to the games or experience in the games. It felt like fodder for, well, I guess it is a cash grab. It just feels like fodder for people who have played the games and they're just trying to make money off of that. It doesn't feel like they're actually trying to introduce anybody to the story of FNAF or get new people in there, which as a new art form for people who don't like games or want to approach in a different way, it could have been a really cool opportunity to do that. But instead, it just feels like pandering. It feels cheap. It feels completely rushed. The only thing that it feels like they actually took time into was knowing that they had to nail the look of Freddy Fazbear and the fucking crew or whatever, because after that Sonic deal, I bet you if anything, they were doing negotiations for the movie, that Sonic shit happened and they were like, we gotta, we, we really gotta nail these looks. What would I have done differently? Who cares what I would have done? But I just saying that what would I have done? They tried doing this in the movie where it's different nights, but they didn't put enough emphasis on it like it does in the games. I think you should have just stayed in the pizzeria. Fuck all of the stupid family bullshit, the dead brother, all that kind of stuff even. Or you know what, fuck it, keep the dead brother. Keep the dead brother in there, I don't give a shit. Get rid of all the other family drama with the aunt. Get rid of the dumbass sister. It's just you trying to figure out who killed your brother because it correlates somehow with this pizzeria. The whole idea is that if you would have not even had to make the movie first person, which I think that would have actually been pretty sweet. You have to carry around a little analog camera. Would have been tight. Just remove all of the fat and make the movie as close to the game as you possibly can because you can still get a good typical Hollywood story out of something as simple as just checking cameras. But it then at least becomes a movie about like finding and uncovering this horrible secret that this place is plagued with dead children. You are fighting for survival. You're fighting for your life. There's constant pressure to have to keep the electricity on and like you could have moments where it goes out and it's like a crazy chase sequence so you have to get back to a safe place. I feel like you could have done so much with the tension of these characters and the uncanniness of how bubbly and cartoonish they look, but it just falls flat. Like there was not one moment in the film where it feels like anybody's in any danger. Like, holy shit. There's a part where they're breaking into Freddy Fazbear's pizza. First off, the guy is like, I'll break in and I'll fuck up Josh Hutcherson's Mike, I'll break in and fuck up Mike's business for $2,000. $2,000. $2, and you're like, that seems very low. And then she's like, 1,000. And he's like, deal. Made me think a 12 year old probably thought that $1,000 is like a million, maybe. Like $1,000, we could buy anything with that, right? He shows up with his crew to Freddy Fazbear's and there's like five or six people. Imagine splitting $1,000 with five or six people. You're gonna commit crime and potentially go to prison for $200 payout. To me, that doesn't necessarily seem worth it, but you know, I digress. There's a part in that scene where a guy is running through Freddy's and you see him on the monitors and he's just screaming, but it, it feels like it, it feels like it's supposed to be funny how he's screaming. And then when you see him die, there's like just some movement of a stiff animatronic and then he has one bloody handprint on a window and that's it. You don't ever get to see any of the kills besides the bite in shadow. You see a girl get cut in half and then a cupcake bites Josh Hutcherson's leg. Oh, and then Matthew Villiard stabs his daughter and then his suit breaks. Yeah, it just feels underwhelming. Like it doesn't feel like there's really any threat there, which I don't think you have to go to like extreme links of gore and violence, but having them even like lurk around more, building more with like different kinds of angles you could have used, the music you could have used, the score doesn't reflect the ominous nature of people being in threat. <laughs> It just feels like a kid's movie, which is fine, but it doesn't feel genuine. It feels like they were actually trying to market this as a horror movie. They're liars. This is a prime example of a movie that feels like a studio has no understanding of why something is popular or culturally relevant or something that means a lot to somebody. And instead, they just see the amount of money they can make off of it because it's a business at the end of the day. It seems like a complete disconnect of the art of what the Five Nights at Freddy community has made versus the corporate side of trying to abuse that community is what it feels like to me. I don't think that they cared to make a convincing adaptation I think that they just kind of phoned it in and just said, hey, if the animatronics look cool, that's all that matters. We could just do like some ghost dream catcher stuff. You guys ever see that movie? That guy's like, I don't like that movie, that movie sucks. So, you know, way to go, Blumhouse. Pretty good stuff. Like usual, Five Nights at Freddy's. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Honestly, I would just, if I were you, I'd just watch Willy's Wonderland. 
or banana splits. Especially if you're a fan of FNAF, I would not consume this. I just feel like it would make you feel bad about the FNAF franchise. Which once again, let me reiterate this. So then when I see all these bitchy comments, you don't even like FNAF, the movie's great. First off, you're wrong. And then secondly, I'm not criticizing the franchise. I am criticizing the people who took the franchise, put it in a bowl and vomited on it and shit on it and took a piss and then said, here's your very, very, very boring child ghost movie. Eat up, piggies. Eat up. Thanks for watching.